All right, everyone, it is 10 o'clock, good where I am, so good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are. My name is Dr. Joanna Broussard. I'm with Statistic Solutions as a qualitative mentor, and I'd like to thank you for joining us for this webinar on Mastering Your Literature Review, the second chapter of your dissertation, or in some cases, your master's thesis. So I've got the chat window up as I go through the presentation. Please feel free to type in any questions that you have. If I see them, I will answer them at that moment. And if not, I will get to them at the end of the slideshow. So we do have a lot to cover, but as sort of a way of introducing myself, my PhD is in rhetoric and argumentation. I looked at um, mental health communication regarding post-traumatic stress disorder and suicidal ideation among combat veterans. So this is something I have done, and this is something that I can really easily talk about because once I figured out how to make the lit review fun for me, it was no longer that one part of my dissertation that I did not want to do. So let's go over the literature review. So what we're going to do in this presentation, we're going to cover all of the sections of a literature review. And like any essay, any paper, any presentation, there are three main sections. The introduction, where you set up what you're going to tell us. The body, where you tell it to us in all of its detail. And here, that will be the literature search strategy, the theoretical framework, and the review of literature. And then the summary or the conclusion, where you remind us of what you just told us, and then you answer the big question, okay, now that I know all this, what do I do with this new information? And as a general reminder, before we get started, always check with your department and with your university for any template, any special requirements, because some places, some schools, some universities, some departments want certain things in the literature review that others may not want. So always check first to see what you may actually need. So in the introduction, which will be about a page long, we have three things that we need to accomplish. One, we need to restate the purpose of the study. Your reader has read through your introduction, most likely, but keep in mind that some people will grab your dissertation, they'll grab a paper for the literature review specifically because they are looking for sources as well. So remind your reader of what the purpose of your study is. Just very general terms, you know, I'm studying this, for whatever reason, because that will feed into the importance and the need for your study. In the introduction, you were setting up what you're going to be talking about. So we need to be reminded what you're studying, why it's important, why is this study needed? And then you will preview the contents of your chapter. Just like an essay has a thesis statement, that sets up the purpose, this essay will persuade, persuade the audience that they should perform some task because of reason one, reason two, reason three. You will do the same thing in the introduction of your literature review. You will set up what you're studying, why you're studying this, why it's important, and you will preview the sections that will follow in the order you're going to present them. And that is essential because the preview should set up what your reader can expect. If you wanna think of the introduction as similar to the trailer for a movie, which is an analogy I would use when I was teaching students, you want to get your reader excited. You want to give them an idea of what they're going to find, what they're going to learn, what they're going to experience, but you don't want to give the whole plot away. 
That will happen in the body. Right now, this is the setup. Once you finish with the introduction, which should be about a page, maybe less than a page if, if you don't need that much, but you really wanna to try to keep it to about one page of typed 12 point font, double space text, because this really is just setting it up. Then we will move on to the first section of our body, which is the literature search strategy. And this is one reason why I reminded you in the beginning to check with your department and your university. A lot will want this, but not everyone wants it to want you to spend time explicitly detailing how you searched for your research. I know my department didn't want this. They wanted me to talk about this in my presentation, but not put it in the document itself. So talk to your chair, talk to your department, talk to your university. But if you should have, but even as you consider searching for your literature, this is something to think about. How are you going to go about searching? We have a lot of information available to us thanks to the internet, but we need to think about where we are looking for our information. So if you, if you do include this section, you will be describing your comprehensive search for research. Uh, what databases did you use? JSTOR, Academic Search Complete, um, I know there. Are, I'm not familiar with the ones for medical science, for physics, but there are, what specific databases did you look at? What search tools did you look at? Did you go from your university library's website and search from there? Did you go through Google? Did you go through Google Scholar? What, how did you find the, the articles, the books, any news resources you may or may not be using. Talk about any specialized journals that you searched. Maybe there's a particular journal that's devoted to issues related to your topic. And you will then maybe search through multiple issues. So if you do that, you'll talk about that specifically listing those journals. What key terms did you use? Did you put key terms in, con in certain combinations that you found were more effective than others? One of the benefits of this section, if you find it in, a, in either in a dissertation that you're reading, is it can help you narrow down your own search criteria and it can help you search more efficiently. So if you do include this, consider that what you're doing this for is for other scholars coming after you help them make more efficient use of time searching the literature. Because we all know that as we start searching, this can be a rabbit hole that we go down and that we forget to come out of for a while. So what key terms, what key term combinations did you use? Which ones worked? Which ones were not overly helpful? How did you filter? your search. That's something to also discuss because it's something to consider as you're looking for your own research. Are you only going to focus on English language journals? What about maybe journals in other languages would have something that would benefit you, but if you're not fluent in the language, that can be a challenge. So what languages are you searching in? Are you looking for full text articles? Or are you just going to, are you going to include abstracts as well? Abstracts can help you get an idea of what's out there. But if you really think the source is going to be helpful, as we all know, the full text, which has all of the results, all of the process that the authors used is indispensable. The date of the publication. Uh, 2015 to the present being an example. Some fields need much more recency than others. Um, I know uh, my mentor's dissertation chair always stated that anything over five years old is 
bordering on, and I quote uh, the late linguist Calvert Watkins, academically prehistoric. But what about the seminal studies in a field? Those are something that you could always con you should always consider mentioning. Like I mentioned with my dissertation, the first major landmark study on suicide was the 1897 book *Le Suicide* by French sociologist Emile Durkheim. Everyone who looks at suicide will mention that in their literature review. You mentioned the big historical developments but you want to focus on the more recent literature. And that can, even that can seem like a lot to sift through. And, that's, and that was what made the literature review daunting for me until one of my professors, Andrew King, specifically sat me down and said, the purpose of your literature review is not to show that you've read everything on your topic. That's humanly impossible. It is to show that you understand where the conversations around this topic are at the moment of you conducting your research and how you fit in to what we're saying about this topic now. Are you extending a conversation? Are you taking it in a new direction? That is what the purpose of your literature review is focused on doing. And so that is really why we want the focus on contemporary recent sources, so that you know what's being said now. Ultimately, as he, he said that, well, you know, the literature review is a narrative. You were telling the story of how you fit into this grand conversation amongst scholars. Show us why you're here and show us what you are bringing new to the table. And that is the literature review. So recent sources, you definitely want to consider that as you filter your, as your searches. Are you looking for a peer review? Academic articles, that could be a way to filter or qualify your work, maybe you don't need news reports, maybe you do, maybe government documents, whatever, what is it that you are focusing on in your literature review, and that will depend on your topic, your stance toward your topic, your field, and what you are trying to accomplish with your research questions. But do consider what you are going to be looking for. Some databases will have a wider variety of options. Academic Search Complete will also include newspapers and magazines that are not peer reviewed. So if as you think about qualifying the sources you're using, it's always a good idea to have sort of a note document saying, okay, I searched this database, I looked for English language, full text only, publications between 2016 and the present, and I wanted peer-reviewed academic articles and or government documents. Having notes of this so you can go back and you can remember, and if you need something else, you can know to maybe broaden your search, or maybe if you have too much, you can think about narrowing down and cutting it out. It's a good, this is also a good reason to think about as you're finding your literature to work on an annotated bibliography that you then arrange by subject. So that way you know what fits where and what, and it can help you as you prepare your literature review. So once you have gone over your search strategy for, for your literature, we then move on to discussing your theoretical framework. Now, again, please check your school's template. Not every school wants this in the literature review. You may have this in your introductory chapter. You may, some may want it, want it primarily discussed in chapter three, your methodology. 
if they want it here, you will take probably an extended discussion of the framework that you might have had in chapter one and broaden it. Give a more full picture of the framework that you're using. As you're talking about your theory, well, who developed it? When was it developed? And what was the original purpose of the theory? Whether this be a quantitative theory or a qualitative theory, give us some show. This is where you show that you understand not only what the theory says, but the history of how it came to be interpreted the way it is interpreted at the present time. Not every theory remains the, the, the same as it was when it was originally conceived. The original creator may have changed as they learned more through more research. New studies using that theory may have found limitations that the theorists didn't have, may have been able to expand past those limitations. We may have learned new things that required changing our understanding of certain things. So who developed it? When? Why did they develop it? And then provide some definitions. You want to define the theory as well as any associated components. So this might also include your, not just your theoretical foundation for your overall research, but that associated with any instruments, any major concepts. You want to define all of the big terms related to theory, methodology, object of study, so that way everyone starts on the same page when they get to your methods and your results and then your discussion. If everyone at least has the same set of definitions, then everyone knows how to make judgments about whether or not your findings have supported your questions and your evidence will support your claims. Clear definitions. These are, these are sort of things that we often don't think about because it's easy to get caught up in academic jargon. And it is necessary to show that you understand that jargon, but consider that most of the people who do read dissertations are grad students who are looking for guidance in how to write theirs. So consider making your work accessible to the average educated person who has not yet mastered the specialized language. So keep definitions clear. Once you have defined all of your key terms and your components, then sort of give a brief history of how researchers have used the theory. I've already touched on this, but this is where you'll say, okay, after this theory was implemented, uh, these people have used it for the following purposes. And through that, we have found limitations. Maybe they've found the actual limits of what it's seen as being useful for. Maybe they have questioned, can we go beyond this? Maybe there's corollaries that have been found to broaden its utility. This is sort of where you give a mini literature review of what the theory has been helpful for for other academics. And then from there, we go back to the idea of this is a narrative of conversation. You will connect to your study. How does the theory help explain what you are studying? Why did you choose this framework? What does it offer you? Are you going to be using it for its intended purpose? Are you going to be maybe testing the limits of a corollary? Are you going to be taking it in a new direction? How is this theory going to help you explain what it is that you seek to study? And this will probably be a couple of pages because you want to give the theory, its history and its interpretation some space to breathe because you wanna make sure that one, you show that you understand this theory and its uses. And two, you wanna make sure it's clear for your audience. Okay, and once you've given your theoretical framework, 
then you will then move on to the next section, which is the review of literature. This is the bulk of the chapter. This is what we came here to read when we read your literature review. You'll be covering the, like I said, primarily the recent literature, maybe some seminal studies if they are essential and if they are still being talked about on your factors, variables, major concepts. If it's a qualitative or a humanities dissertation, you'll talk about what's been studied on your artifact, maybe your artifact, your phenomenon, culture, the big themes that you're looking at, like using my research as an example. My literature review looked at um, PTSD, communication of mental health amongst military enlisted officers and veterans, as well as, as well as suicide, both how it's been discussed in the mental health literature and how it's being talked about in more non-professional circles. <clears throat> so I looked at all sorts of different discourses and literatures, but I arranged it by theme. The history of post-traumatic stress disorder as a diagnosis from the ancient world, World War I, World War II, Vietnam, the present, how it's talked about in popular discourse, as well as political and professional settings, as well as then suicide amongst soldiers, veterans, politicians, general population, and their conversations around that. You will be using headers to organize your material into sections based on factors, variables, major concepts, themes. Check your style guide because again, MLA, Chicago Manual of Style, APA, Turabian, Harvard B, all of these will have different rules and you wanna be consistent with what's expected of you. As you organize the material into sections, You'll begin by having a section introduction, and then you'll be and you'll go on to review research. Consider each section like a mini paper introduction. Set up what we're going to talk about. Body, review the research, give us the details, and then sort of a brief summary. Wrap it all up, and then segue on to your next section. And again, these little section introduction and concluding paragraphs will probably be brief paragraphs, two to three sentences, just to sort of get us in the mood. Okay, here's what we're talking about. Here's how it connects. Now let's see what we got. Then we review and then we summarize and segue. And of course, reviewing the research consists of both synthesis of the findings and analysis therein. Now, let's move on and have an example of synthesis. Synthesis is where you combine the parts to form a whole. You wanna take information from studies to make your points. You want to synthesize at the paragraph level using the standard paragraph organization strategy. A topic sentence, evidence and discussion of your topic, and a summary sentence that transitions to the next. When I, when I would teach composition, rhetoric, public speaking, I would always use what's called the 4S structure. You state your claim, that's your topic sentence. You tell us what, this, what claim this paragraph is making, you then support it with evidence from the document. And then you summarize the significance to your overall argument that you're making. And then you segue to your next topic. And so this is what you're doing with the synthesis in paragraphs, because the goal is to make this as readable and as engaging for the reader as a review of literature can be. So an example, notice how in yellow, we will have the start of the topic sentence, the start of the evidence and discussion in green, 
and then the summary and transition in blue. So our topic sentence. Recent research has mostly shown that health literacy is an important factor in diabetic self-care and positive outcomes. And then in the parenthetical, we have the sources that are being cited in this paragraph. Then we move on to discuss each one of those sources. Anders et al. conducted a systematic review of the concept of health literacy, and you can see that. Gregory et al. reviewed 115 recent studies. <coughs> Excuse me. In a quantitative study, Talbot et al. examined the relationship between diabetes, and you can see. And then we see, unlike Anders et al. and Gregory et al., Phillips et al. found no statistically significant relationship. We have an overall synthesis of what the literature says. And then we move on to the summary and transition. Empirical evidence from recent research largely supports that diabetic health literacy is a vital component of patient self-efficacy, diabetic control, and clinical outcomes. <coughs> Excuse me. But we want the paragraph to read like a paragraph as opposed to just taking one source and then just going source by source by source. We want summaries based on themes, topics, ideas, categories. So that way what we have is something that the reader can go, okay, if I'm looking for stuff on health literacy, well, these are the sources that I need to go to the bibliography and look for. Always consider when you're writing anything, a paper, a conference presentation, an article manuscript for a journal, your dissertation, a book chapter, consider that one of the big things that we look for as scholars is sometimes other sources. So make finding these sources as user-friendly for your reader as you possibly can. And then we will move on to the analysis section of our literature review. Here, we will analyze the research that, will in, that does involve noting shortcomings and gaps. I know this is something that I remember when I was taking my writing classes as a graduate student. <coughs> Excuse me again. That a lot of people were, well, I'm, I'm just a student. How can I say that this literature isn't great? Because the literature was written by humans. They did the best they could with the information they had available to them, but not everything, not every study examines everything, and not every study is even aware of some of the gaps that might have, that might arise based on other research that has been done since the study was conducted. <coughs> also, gaps in the literature are where you get to fill things in. Note the trends. What are people talking about now? What are people not talking about at present? Because that is really important to show. It's not just that you've read what's there, but that you understand how the conversation is flowing at present. Show that, you, that, you're, that you're not just hearing, but you're listening, if you will. Again, reiterate the research problem that you're addressing and why your study is needed when that seems appropriate. Because if you're talking about something and hey, no one is mentioning this specific thing and that is why I'm conducting the study that I'm conducting in order that I might answer this question that has arisen from this gap in the literature. Ultimately, your analysis will culminate in an argument for why your study needs to be conducted.
And so that is something, the literature review isn't a simple history piece. It is ultimately an argument for why your dissertation, your research needs to happen. And so your analysis section needs to then culminate in setting up, hey, because all this has been said, but no one's talking about this. And it's really important that we talk about this. So that's why I am studying what I am studying. So that way we can fill, we can start to fill in this gap in the literature. And from there, you will then move on to your summary. Now, remember in the introduction, you set everything up, you got us excited for what we we're gonna learn, learn in this chapter. You previewed the contents in the body. You went over everything, including your search strategy, your theoretical framework, a synthesis of the literature, and your analysis of the literature. And now in your summary, as you conclude this chapter, you will recap the major points from the chapter, <clears throat> remind your audience of the journey you have taken them on. And this is important as we move through a document because as we read documents like dissertation, articles, as we listen to presentations, we're using our short-term memory. And given that a dissertation chapter can be between 20 or 30 pages, by the time we reach the summary, we may have forgotten some of the details from the beginning of the chapter, the beginning of the presentation. And so we recap. We talk about the major points. We give a little reminder, spend some time, a couple of sentences on each major point. And then we move on to reminding the reader of the research problem based on what is in and what is not in the literature. So it's not just saying, hey, here's the, here's the problem that I'm trying to address, but it's Here's the problem in light of its context within the body of literature. And then you will conclude by reiterating the need for your study in a way that also segues to discussing your methodology, which will be chapter three. And so <clears throat> this is the literature review chapter. <clears throat> it's an essential and important chapter that connects your study to all the work that's been done and that is being done around your topic in your field and possibly in other fields as well. It demonstrates that you know the trends in the literature, that you can synthesize what's being taught, what's being said, and you can analyze it in an insightful way that points out gaps that need to be filled. And then as you summarize, again, recap the major points, remind the reader of your research problem in the context of the literature, and then reiterate the need for your study while segueing to your methodology. And that is the literature review. Does anyone have any questions? We have a few minutes left. I am more than happy to answer questions. Oh, you're welcome. Well, thank you. And I would like to point out that we at, Stati at Statistics Solutions offer a comprehensive dissertation consulting and mentoring service. If you're interested in learning more, uh, you, can con you can email info at Statistics Solutions. Let me pull that page back up because for some reason, uh, it was recorded. Celia or Sierra, would it be able to, are they able to get copies of this? 
because I believe so, but I'm not entirely certain. So as you can see, okay, here's a question. In identifying gaps, should I just copy and paste previous gaps and then synthesize? That is a good question. And annoyingly enough, uh, the general answer is it will depend. However, I wouldn't copy and paste. I would make sure that every one, make sure everything is in your own words because you, one, of the, one of the fun parts about conducting research is you're bringing in together all sorts of different sources, but they don't all have the same rhythm when you read them. And so you want everything to sound like it belongs together. So if you find gaps, someone's mentioned gaps, one, check to make sure that those haven't been already filled in by someone else. And if they do, what you will want to do is take the, is then filter that into your synthesis as you're discussing the literature. Because as you're doing so, well, here's a gap. You're probably not going to find the gap initially, but as you look through your sources. So please consider taking your This will because when you're doing, I know a lot of people will go, I want to synthesize and then I want to analyze. Honestly, you're probably going to do both at the same time. So don't copy and paste a gap and then synthesize. As you're talking about the literature on the topic, you'll probably have, here's what's been said. Okay. It should be maybe, it should be noted that in the literature, this is a gap. You can analyze, that will be your analysis, which will probably be after your synthesis paragraph or synthesis paragraphs, depending on how much literature you wanna talk about or there is to talk about. So, because you will not be, you're not identifying gaps to synthesize, you are synthesizing so that you can point out the gaps in your analysis. It's, it is a, step one, then step two. Does that answer your question? So yes, for those who may not have seen it, um, within 48 hours, there will be a copy of the webinar sent out. And again, as I've mentioned, um, you can, if you want to know more about what services we offer, contact info at statisticsolutions.com in order to receive, to schedule a complimentary 30 minute consultation between the hours of 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. Eastern time, Monday through Friday. Our phone number is 877-437-8622. Any other questions? Okay, questions. Again, I'm so I'm I'm so glad you finally you all found it helpful. Thank you all for joining us, and I wish you all well in your academic endeavors as graduate students and beyond. Remember, the dissertation is not the be all end all. It is the beginning of your bright futures as academics. And you are all welcome. And I do hope that I do hope this helps. And I hope you do refer back to it, not just to hear the words that I have spoken, but because the literature review is a process and it's not something that's easy to do in one go. It takes time, it takes several drafts. And I know for myself, this was the most frustrating part of writing the dissertation because I found it boring 
until I understood it as conversation and a narrative of my place in the grand scheme of what I was studying. So I hope that's somewhere you can, you can take that no one expects you to know everything, but they expect you to show that you understand where the conversation has come from, where it is, and where you plan on leading it in the future. Okay, one final call for questions. Okay, questions, questions, going once, going twice. If there are no further questions, then feel free to email us with any questions that come up afterward. Feel free to contact for any help that we may offer you with your, your topic development, your introduction, the literature review, methodology, research. Would I repeat the four steps of the paragraph? All right, I will gladly do that. Okay, the four steps, um, I use what's called the 4S structure. One, state your claim. That's your topic sentence. Every paragraph needs to make a claim about something in the world around it. Two, you will support with credible evidence. Three, you will summarize the significance of your evidence to your overall topic. And four, you will segue into the next topic of conversation. I'm going to end with by discussing a very silly little example I always gave freshman students, okay? Let's say you're writing, a, you're writing a paper about why pizza is healthy. And so you've got a thesis statement. Pizza, I, in this essay, I will convince you that pizza is a health food. It didn't use it. Instead of saying segue, the example gave what, how did it put it? It said summary and transition. I use segue simply because alliteration is a mnemonic device that has since or post since all communication was oral has helped people remember. Segue, transition, those words can be used interchangeably, but my ancestors are German. We like alliteration. And so I tend to use alliteration. So Either, either segue or transition will work, but I wanna make sure that you guys have sort of a simple formula because when you have a formula, it makes it easy to get creative and to feel free. And Stephen, trust me, I've been there. When you know you wanna ask something, but you're not sure what you wanna ask, that's perfectly fine. So again, Feel free to contact us if you have any questions or would like further help. Oh, the transition example on the screen. Given that I don't know what's comes, what would come next, I'm assuming that the transition would be to... Um, Maybe a, maybe a discussion of self-efficacy. I'm going to assume that's going to be the next topic. It's not a clear transition, but a lot of, one of the things that academic literature is often forgetting is to transition fluidly. And so it has that newscaster switching from camera to camera. So yeah, you're right. If there's a transition, it's not clear. But, and when, when I'm, if those unfamiliar, if you know the old newscaster reels, the, they'll look in one camera and very seriously say, <clears throat> uh, we will be sending this out within 24 to 48 hours, Terry. Don't worry. You'll be, you'll get a copy of it. 
That said, if you need help, info at statisticsolutions.com. We look forward to hearing from you and we look forward to your success as academics, as scholars, and as people. Have a lovely day. And may all of your future in academia be bright.